For those of you who are awake this morning, you see that I was on a leash this morning with that microphone. Our, uh, our good handheld cordless bit the dust this week, so we have to find another one. And I'm not, I trip over cords and step on cords and all that kind of stuff. That's why I'm not on a leash. Um, it's hard for me to be on a leash this morning. So uh, we're glad that you're here to hear what God's Word has to say today. Uh, I hope that you don't come here to hear me. I hope that you come here to hear God's Word because God's Word is very important to our lives and it's very important to who we are. And we look at this sermon series that we've been in, Everyone Eventually Answers to God, and we realize that everywhere we've seen Amos talk about something, there's been positive and negative intervention that was going to be a possibility. What's that mean? Benefits and consequences, right? Right? In our world today and in our own personal lives, don't we always face benefits or consequences based on the choices that we make? Sure we do. And so as we think about what Amos has been telling, one of the things that Amos has done is he's directly addressed the people and told them what God thinks about them. And we're going to find out today that... um, Quiet culture or silencing people has not always been just a new thing for us. It's been going on for a long time. And every time in the Bible that we meet somebody who's really speaking out for God, there's somebody there who wants to shut them up. And they, they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're good, doing good work. Um, I'll just give you a little illustration this morning as I'm thinking about this. I was hearing a story about a young man this morning, uh, 18 years old, in Idaho, And he made a statement, boys are boys and girls are girls. That's what he said. Boys are boys and girls are girls. His high school banned him from walking in his graduation. And he was getting ready to be hired by the National Park Service to be a wildfire fighter. The guys who go out and jump out of helicopters on a string and they drop them and they go out and fight the wildfires. He was supposed to start working today, and the government rescinded the job offer to him because he said, boys are boys and girls are girls. And that's the world we live in. And there are churches out there that think that boys aren't boys and girls aren't girls. And Amos has been pointing all these things out of all the things that people do and say that make them sound religious or look religious, but when it comes right down to it, it's exactly the opposite of what God's Word says. Uh, Jan was telling me that she saw a young lady the other day, and she felt compelled by God to go over and talk to her, and she found out that this young lady had just taken on a new quote-unquote Christian ideology or a Christian perspective. She'd become a Quaker, Um, you know, like the guy on the oat box, Quaker Oats, William Penn, the guy that started Pennsylvania. But as she began to talk to this young lady, she said, well, what do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus died for our sins? And she said, yeah, but we don't believe any of the literal stuff like he rose from the dead. How can you believe in Jesus? And, and what the difference? Everybody dies. If you just believe he died, I believe everybody's going to die until Jesus comes back, don't you? How is that a Christian belief system? It's not. It's not. And, you know, we see that religion, when it comes in and takes over and becomes the most important thing in people's lives, rather than a true belief in the God who created this world and the God who knows what he knows and did what he did and does what he does and is going to do what he's promised he's going to do, It's a terrible thing to see that so many people in our world today just think they're fine, that they're okay, and they're going to get through this. But, you know, the Bible tells us that only those who are victorious are going to receive the rewards from Christ. Have you read that in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation? Only those who are victorious, only those who believe, only those who persevere to the end, those are the ones who are going to receive. And the only way that you can truly believe in Jesus, you have to believe in God's word. If you don't believe in God's word, how do you understand the God who gave us his word? How do you understand who Jesus is? How do you understand the work of the Holy Spirit? And how do you understand how you're supposed to live if you don't believe that God's word is the actual word of God? How do you do that? And there are going to be a lot of people who've said, well, I was a Christian, but I just didn't believe this, this, and this. And one day they're going to bow before Jesus and say, Jesus is Lord. And he's going to say, you have to go there. But, 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 no, I don't know you. You don't know me. You don't belong to me. You didn't serve me. You gave lip service and you believed the lie. Go. And you know what? 
there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be bamboozled on that day wondering, why can't I get into heaven? That's, I did exactly what they told me to do. But you see, it's not about that. That's why we're all called to read God's word. We're all called to understand God's word. We're to run away from false teachers and false teachings. And we're to live by God's word. And if we do that, we are guaranteed that we're going to belong to Jesus. But we can't compromise with God's word. We can't say, well, that's what it says, but I believe this is something totally different. And we need to read it in our context. No, you don't read what's going on in today's world into God's word. You read what God's word said and you bring it out and you apply it to your life. Does anybody believe that? That's how it works. That's how it works. But you know, there are a lot of people who sit in churches all across this world who don't believe they're ever going to have to answer to Jesus for anything. They believe they're just going to get in. And there are a lot of people out there who don't even go to church who don't think they're ever going to have to answer to God for anything. They just think they're going to get in. And the sad thing is, they're people that we know and we love and we care about. Aren't they? They're people that we know. People that we love. People that we care about. And that's why we should work extra hard to try to do everything that we can to help them understand why God's word is truth. And God's word is real. And it's not the most popular thing to do. It's not. And we need to support people like that young man who took a stand. A biological stand. He just made a biological statement. That's all he said. But it was politically incorrect. And now his chances of his dream are gone. Look at that. And do you know who brought him up on charges? Do you know who made the biggest stink about it? The teachers in his school. The teachers in his school. There's one teacher there. She claims to be a Christian even. But she's a promoter of a play called The Vagina Monologues, which is a very feminist, nasty, sexual thing. And she said, you can't say that. She turned him in, and all, a couple other teachers got against him. And, you know, I don't know whether the young man is a Christian or not. But it's a Judeo-Christian belief that if God created a man, he created a man. If he created a woman, he created a woman. And a woman can't be a man, and a man can't be a woman. And anybody that teaches God's word that tells people anything other than that is going to stand before God, and they're going to be held to a more severe and strict judgment. And you who know the truth and don't tell people about it, you're going to be held to have to answer to Jesus too. What we know, we're responsible for, aren't we? Ken, when you were a recruiter, they didn't teach you to be a recruiter, so you couldn't go recruit, right? Yeah. John, you didn't learn how to be a construction guy if you weren't going to use your tools and go do construction, right? So as we look at our lives, we're gifted to do what we do, and when we belong to Jesus, that's the same thing. So we've got to grow where we're planted. We've got to do what we're supposed to do because there will be positive and negative intervention in this world at some point. Well, Amos has been clearly resisting God's, or relating God's displeasure with Israel through warnings and condemnation, okay? He's warning them, he's condemning them, he's used a lot of literary devices to draw mental pictures. Didn't he remember him say fat cows? He called the women fat cows because they were luxurious, and he talked, he called people last week luxurious loungers. They just lay around eating all the delicacies and and not taking care of the poor. He called them... uh, Fallen virgin, because once the virginity is gone, it can't be restored, right? And then he called him a big nothing burger. Remember the play on words last week? Low to bar means nothing. He said, you've really done nothing. You've conquered nothing when he was talking about the king and some battles that they had won. And he said, you think you're working out of strength, but you couldn't beat strength, and you don't even know strength. And as God sends Amos to talk to the people, it seems as though nobody's paying attention. Because we haven't seen any great revival in the book of Amos, have we? We haven't seen a great turning to God. We haven't seen anything there. And so as we look at this, he's going to start relaying some visions that God's given him. Now, that's a very popular thing in our world today, visions. People say they're getting visions from God. Well, we're going to stop right there just for a second. All the visions that are contained in the Bible are all the visions that are ever coming to anybody on this earth. Do you believe that? 
There is no modern prophet. There are no modern people getting visions. God's word says what he needs us to know for now. We'll know the rest of it when we get there. But there are a lot, there's a big push in our world for prophets and people who can have dreams and visions. And their dreams and visions are just, they just don't line up with anything that the Bible teaches most of the time. But this is a dream and a, or visions that God has given Amos. And so we're going to read down through uh, a two, three, three of them. Uh, he's going to have three visions, verses 1 through 9, of destruction, but only two of intervention. Now listen to that. Three visions that include total destruction, only one vision, or two, one vision doesn't give an answer to that, the other two give a reprieve. So let's look down through here. Let's read verses 1 through 9. The sovereign Lord showed me a vision. I saw him preparing to send a vast swarm of locusts over the land. This was after the king's share had been harvested from the fields and as the main crop was coming up. In my vision, the locusts ate every green plant in sight. And then I said, O sovereign Lord, please forgive us or we will not survive for Israel is so small. So the Lord relented from this plan. I will not do it, he said. Now, as we see here, these locusts really refer to economic and food-related disaster. Anybody remember in the last three years where you couldn't go to the store and buy what you were looking for? Anybody remember all of these accidents that didn't know how anybody, nobody knows how they happened where a plane flew into a chicken plant up in New Hampshire and a, and a beef processing plant blew up and burned and a dairy cattle ex, um, farm that had like 28,000 head of cattle just blew up one day. You know, the, we have food problems in our world today. It's not getting any cheaper. It's not getting any better. I'm not saying it's the, it's the plague of locusts that Amos was talking about, but I believe, and you've heard me say from the time we started this book, that we are reaping the benefits of this nation turning its back on God. All the things that we see, I believe God has his hand in it. Nothing happens by accident. God's showing us that we need to get it straightened out. We need to get it figured out. And so we see Amos talking here in verses 1 through 3. Um, but look what happens. He sees the vision, and then in verse 2 he says, O oh, sovereign Lord, please forgive us or we will not survive, for Israel is so small. And verse 3 says, the Lord relented from his plan, I will not do it. Has anybody ever heard this scripture before? The effective, fervent prayers of a righteous person accomplishes much. Has anybody ever heard that scripture before? Here is one man standing in the gap between a country that's getting ready to be punished by God, punished severely. And he prays and he asks God not to do it, and God relents, okay? Now, to, in, in the King James Version, some of them it says God repents. God never repents. God doesn't have anything to repent from. What does it mean to relent? Does anybody know? What does it mean? To let up, to change plans, to do something different, but not to apologize for what was about to go on. And then as we look at verses 4 through 6, there's another version. The sovereign Lord showed me another vision. I saw him preparing to punish his people with a great fire. The fire had burned up the depths of the sea and was devouring the entire land. Then I said, O sovereign Lord, please stop or we will not survive for Israel is so small. Then the Lord relented from his plan to, I will not do either, said the sovereign Lord. So as we look at this, they're looking at total annihilation. Because if a fire is so hot, it can burn the ocean up. That's bad, isn't it? And if it's burning the entire land up, God has told them, I will wipe you out. He told them when he sent them into the promised land, if you do what I say, then I'm going to bless you while you're there. He said, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to vomit you out of the land. And already we've heard Amos tell them what it's going to look like when they go out with hooks in themselves. And we found out that the elite people were the ones who were going to be dragged out first, and then the rest of the people. And what we know about the history of Israel is that when God decided to send the Assyrians in in 721 B.C., 
People were let out with meat hooks through them, just on a chain with meat hooks in them, pulled, uh, pulled by whoever was taking them back to Assyria. And they took the youngest and the brightest, and they made eunuchs out of them, of the men. They made eunuchs. Anybody know what a eunuch is? All the guys are just going, Aah! right? I'll tell you, it's what they do to make a bull of steer, for those of you who don't know. Only they didn't use a little rubber band. They used a big, sharp knife, okay? And as we look at that, that was God's punishment on the people who kept rejecting him. They went into slavery, but it took away their personhood even. Do you hear that? So as we think about what God was promising, and we know that God is a God who keeps his promises, you know, God, I believe, has some pretty unique things lined up for us that we haven't even begun to imagine what they might be yet as he continues to rain his wrath down on this country for its rejection of who he is. Does anybody really believe that? If we did, we'd do something different. If we did, we'd make a difference in somebody's life. If we did, we'd be shouting from the rooftops or walking up and talking to people at the restaurant and finding out who they are and what they're all about and trying to help them understand that there's something different, that God has a better plan than whatever it is that they're trying to figure out. We'd be doing that. We really would. And so as we unpack this a little bit, Amos intercedes in both of these visions by asking God to extend his grace and to have pity on Israel. How many of you believe that God's grace has been extended to the United States of America. Absolutely. God is a gracious God, slow to anger. He's not willing that any should perish. And man, I'm telling you, he must really have a lot of patience to see what's going on in our world today. Anybody believe that? I mean, religion is corrupt. Government is corrupt. People are corrupt. Families are falling apart. Everywhere we look, everything's just going backwards or down the drain. But God hasn't wiped it out yet. And as long as God hasn't wiped it out, that means his grace is still available. And his grace is available to anybody that will call on his name, that will cry out to him and say, God, I give my life to you. Please forgive me for I'm a sinner and I want to live my life for you and I want to learn what it means to belong to you. And that's what we got to focus on and that's what we've got to do. That's why we, you know, we gave you a paper last week to fill out about this new abortion-free Allegheny. So a lot of you turned it in on the way out. Uh, if you still have that, turn it in. Please let us know. Uh, we're going to send them on to the people that are organizing this thing, and somebody will be contacting people. And, and, you know, it went from as simple as I'm willing to pray to I'm willing to be right there. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to talk to somebody. I'm willing to, to counsel somebody and help them understand why destroying a life is not a good thing and why destroying a child who's already alive is not a good thing by offering them the chemicals that everybody wants to give them today. It's amazing to me that parents would look at their child and say, it's better for me to destroy you than it is for me to help you to become somebody. Isn't that amazing? You think God's okay with that? He's not. He's not okay with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm on a mission right now. I have been asked by somebody to do some research for a news story on some of the things that are going on in the local denominations and the local churches around here as far as LGBTQ and all that stuff goes. There's going to be a news story about it, and I'm going to be a part of that. So uh, pray for me because I know that as soon as I start doing my research and making some phone calls, I know what's going to happen, okay? I don't care. I ain't scared. I'm not scared. But we're going to keep exposing the lie for the lie that it is. How about that? And I got that call the other day, and so I've got some homework to do. I've got some research to do, and I've got some numbers to put together, and I've got some people to interview, and I've got some things to do. And I'm going to guarantee you that a lot of them, when I call them and they say, I say, I want to talk to you about this, this, and this, and they're going to say, oh, nope, not me. How many of you think are going to do that? The majority will do that because they're afraid. They're afraid of what somebody might say. They're afraid to stand for God. And this is what I'm saying this morning. Jesus said these words, if you're ashamed of me in front of man, I will be ashamed of you in front of my father. And there are too many people in this world that are selling people a boat ride to hell instead of giving them the opportunity to climb the stairway to heaven. Anybody believe that? And they're denominationally driven and it's politically driven. And so we're going we're to get involved in some of that. 
Now, God did not change his mind as man does, but he changed his course of action. Two times, two times, Amos said, Lord, please don't do that because we'll be destroyed, we're small. And it says that God relented. God didn't change his mind, he just changed his plan, okay? He changed his plan. And that is very consistent with God's attribute of immutability. Immutability. In Malachi, God says, I do not change, therefore you are not destroyed. Because the Bible says God is patient, slow to anger, not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life, right? And if God changed his mind about that, we don't have a chance, do we? We don't have a chance because all of our righteousness is filthy rags. All of our righteousness is nothing. We need God's grace. We need God's mercy. We need God's help. We need God's strength. We need God's wisdom. We need all those things to be who God wants us to be. And if God just got so mad at us, he said, I'm done with you, then all the promises Jesus made would be null and void. Of those the Father gives me, I won't lose one, but I'll raise them all up on the last day, right? Let's just start right there. God has a plan. And sometimes we have to walk through some very dark places, some very deep places in our own weakness before we can see God's hand at work, don't we? We sure do. And so as we see this, God isn't changing his mind. He's just changing his plan. Um, Because you've heard me say this once. You've heard me say it a thousand times. Before God created human beings, he already had a contingency for every opportunity that we would have to make a decision. How many of you, when you make a decision, think you only have two choices? Red or green, black or white, yes or no. How many of you believe that you really only have two choices? Am I going to wear that or am I going to wear that? How many of you normally narrow it down to two choices, ladies, when you're looking in your closet and you're saying, huh, I ain't ready for my bikini yet and it's still a little winter and I got to decide what I'm going to wear and I got, like my house, I just took all my winter clothes upstairs because it's way too hot for long pants for me. And I brought all my shorts and my short sleeve shirts downstairs, right? But I have to realize that I have to try those all on now and see if they still fit before I can wear them. Anybody ever have to do that besides me? Normally I wear it to get it down to two, two things. You know, today I had a choice between a pair of jeans and a pair of Dickies pants. These are just plain old Dickies work pants, right? And I thought, man, it was hot yesterday and it's humid this morning. And I thought, when I go in the church, who knows what it's going to be? Hot, humid, cold? I don't know. It's never cold in here. Never cold. Those of you who don't believe me, it's never cold in here. It's never cold in here. Never. Okay? It's always too hot in here. And I had to choose between a pair of jeans and a pair of and th- these pants. And then I had to figure out what shirt I was going to wear. But you know what? When we make choices, God doesn't have to sit and say, now what am I going to do? Does he? He already knows what we're going to do, and he's made an option that leads to him through just about every contingency of choices that we can make. So when God relents against what he's going to do for Israel because Amos prays, God still is a righteous God, and if they're living an unrighteous life, they're going to pay for it. Maybe not today, but they're going to pay for it, right? And so as we continue to look down what's going on here, that's consistent with his eternal non-changingness, his immutability. And it's the difference between walking with the wind and walking against the wind. The wind is still a factor, right? Anybody? If you're walking into the wind, you know the wind's in your face. If you're walking with the wind, the wind's behind you. But the wind is the constant. Here's the, here's the thing. God's still going to do what he's going to do. He's the constant. Amos prayed. Amos prayed, God, please don't destroy them. Do you know why he interceded for them? If you remember, Amos is not even from Israel. He's not even from Israel. He's from Judah. He's praying for a people that are not his people, that God would not destroy them. Why? Because he wants to see them turn back to God. He wants to see them come to Jesus as you can do that in the Old Testament, which will be coming back to God. And we think about that. How many of us 
pray for people that we don't know. How many of us pray for people that, that are on a lifestyle that's leading them straight down the path of hell, and we know that they're going for destruction, and we pray, God, please, please. I prayed with somebody the other day. They said, I've been trying to talk to somebody that I know, and they just won't hear it from me. So I said, well, let's pray for this right now. And I stood there and prayed that God would bring somebody else into that person's life that they would listen to since they won't listen to the person who's trying to help them understand who Jesus is. How about that? How many of us think to pray about already our kids and the person they're going to marry if we have kids that are going to be married one of these days? How many of us pray while they're in school that they won't get stuck with those other kids, but that they would be a witness to those kids so those kids who are stuck can get unstuck and come to Jesus? You see, Amos is willing to pray that God would stop that plan and give more time for those people to come and understand who Jesus is and understand what God's all about. And as we understand what he did, we have the right and the power of intercession as we pray for people who are lost and bound by sin, don't we? We're supposed to stand in the gap. That's what an intercessor does. An intercessor is somebody who stands in the gap. If you've got somebody in your life that's going through a major calamity, you can pray for them, pray with them, stand there and, and beseech God on their behalf to try to get God to intervene in a way that would be a little different. But you know, there's too many people out there that say, well, you just have to declare and demand that God's going to do this. <laughs> you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just say, God, don't let that person go through that. Fix it right now. And he did it. But who's the one who declares and demands? God does, and we are not God. We are not God. We don't create our own reality. We don't speak things into existence. That's a big thing that's going on in the world now. Speaking your own existence, it doesn't happen. What we do is we say, God, I surrender my will to your will. And when my will lines up with God's will, man, it can be an amazing thing. An amazing thing, but it doesn't mean the attacks stop coming. And it doesn't mean that hardship's not on the way. But until I turned my life over to Jesus Christ, I was on my way to a hopeless, Christless eternity. Hopeless, Christless eternity, separated from God to be tormented in the lake of fire forever and ever in front of Jesus and all of his angels. The Bible says that. We read that a couple weeks ago. But God pulled me in, changed my life, called me his own. But I had to be a part of that. I had to repent of my sins, and I had to turn my life over to him, and I had to ask for his forgiveness. And you know what? People in our world today are so proud that they won't. They're so convinced that they're just okay that they won't. And no matter sometimes how many times we say it or show it or demonstrate it, they still don't get it. But you see, God's not willing that any should perish, but he knows some will. He knows some will. He knows some will flat right out reject him. But we don't know who they are, and that's why we need to stay busy, don't we? There's an idea out there that if God's going to save them, he's going to save them. We shouldn't have a part in that. It's called hyper-Calvinism. No. Jesus said, wherever you go, make disciples. Baptize them in my name and teach them everything that I've taught you. Didn't he? And that's what we need to be doing because we don't know who the next person is that God's going to send our way, that we have the opportunity to open our mouth and speak truth to them, and they're going to hear that and say, you know what, that's the answer I was looking for right there. How many people do you believe in our world today that are looking for answers to their spiritual questions? How many people? Every one of them are. And guess what? We have the answers. But sometimes it's the best kept secret in the world, isn't it? And we don't want it to be a secret. We want it to be what God wants. We see a couple examples in the Bible of people who interceded for their own friends and for other people. If you turn to Colossians 4.12, we meet a guy that traveled with Paul. His name was Epaphras. And this is what it says, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and he says, Epaphras, a member of your fellowship and a servant of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. He always prays for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. That's his prayer for his family, his church family, that they would be who God wants them to be, following God's will, doing what God wants. Do we pray for each other like that here at Cumberland Community Church? Or do we just pray for our list? Do we pray for our problems? Do we just pray for the people that we know? Or do we pray for each other? Do we even know each other? 
Do we go out of our way on Sunday morning to meet somebody new, or do we just talk to the people that we already know? Do we come in late so we don't have to talk to anybody? Do we leave early so we don't have to talk to anybody? If we're going to be a church family, we ought to care about each other, shouldn't we? Pastor Ron, there you go again. You're the only one that's supposed to know everybody's name. I don't want to hear excuse. I don't know how to learn people's names because we all learn people's names, don't we? It's just a matter of us taking our time to find out who somebody is. And do you know how you find, how people know that you care for them? You learn their name. And you talk to them. And you don't just say, wow, isn't it humid out today, and walk off. You talk. But we've lost the art of talking in our world today. We've lost the ability. You know, I had to apologize to Keith. I stopped by his shop three times this week. I said, I'm sorry to keep interrupting your week. You know? But I had to talk to him about something. And you can ask Rachel, I'm not a texter. If you send me more than two texts, you better call me or I'm not answering. I can't sit there for 30 minutes texting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. When you can tell me what you need to tell me and I'll be done with it in two minutes. And i got to pick up my phone and read what you wrote and put something back on there. And a lot of my answers are grunting, mm -hmm, yep, mm, yep, mm, whatever. Right? We need to talk to each other. We need to care about each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to intercede for each other. Tracy puts out a prayer list every week in the bulletin and sends out prayer requests every week by email. Do we pray for those people? Do we intercede on their behalf? Do we call out to God for them? We should. We should. Because what did Jesus say? He said, whatever two or three of you agree on in my name, it'll be done. And all we need to really pray for is for God's will to be done in that person's life and that they would have the strength if they have to endure it or be able to rejoice if God just decides to take it away, right? There's no promise that God's going to take it away. There's just hope that God will be with us. And then let's turn real quick to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, Paul, again, is talking about what it looks like when people intercede, when people pray for each other. And here is what it says. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Man, wouldn't it be nice if we could live peaceful and quiet lives as Christians in our world today and not be harassed at every turn. But when we intercede for people, when we start praying, we become evil's enemy and evil will find a way to get to us and evil will find a way to destroy us. He says, this is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. Do you hear that right there? God wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but how can they hear if there's nobody there to tell them? Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Okay? How can they hear if there's nobody there to tell them? That's our job. That's what Amos is doing. He's telling them about who God is. And then we get to verse nine, 7 through 9, and we see a building utensil being used. It's called a plumb line. Has anybody ever used a plumb line before? Anybody know what a plumb line is? It's something that hangs on a string so you can tell what's plumb. We don't use plumb lines anymore. What do we use? We use a level, don't we? Because the level tells you if it's level, and then if you turn it this way, it'll tell you if it's plumb. That means straight up and down, not leaning this way, not leaning this way, not leaning that way, not leaning that way. And if you start with a piece of Building material that is not level and plumb, what do you end up when you're done? It's out of square, it's out of level, it's out of plumb, and you sing the little song, there was a crooked man who built a crooked house, right? When I used to do construction, if the guy that poured the basement didn't get the basement squared, by the time you got up to the second floor, it could be two inches out of square. And you try to fit a square cabinet in a two-inch out of square room, they don't work. you got to cut them, trim them down, whatever you got to do. So we see this plumb line thing. And we're going to read these verses, 7 through 9. Then he showed another vision, and I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. Straight. What's the way that leads to righteousness? Straight and narrow. 
You see that? Straight and narrow. If you hold a plumb line down and, it, and the wall's back this way, you know that something's wrong. The wall's eventually going to fall. If you hold the plumb line down up here and the wall's out, it'll, it'll lay on the wall and it won't look like it's right and the wall could cave in the other way. So as we, as we look at this, God is the one who is determining, listen to this, God is the one who's determining whether his people are right or whether they're wrong, whether they're in plumb or whether they're out of plumb. Who's deciding that? God is because he's the builder, right? God is the builder, not man. Man has decided, hey, you know what? If it's within a quarter of an inch or half an inch or three quarters of an inch or an inch, it's okay. No big deal. There's nothing perfect in the world. Well, we were in a church that we started up in Missouri. And when you looked at the platform, it looked all right. But one day I started walking across it and I got shorter as I went off to the left. And within a span, just about that long, maybe a little bit longer, it was out of level almost four inches. Almost four inches. And then we went to do something up above, and we found out that the ceiling was falling down. Because what they didn't know about construction when Joe Bob and Bubba and, and Billy Bob and, and all those hillbilly people were building the church, they used nails that long. And there were gaps between the boards sometimes that were that far, but they had enough nails sticking in both boards that it held it all together. I don't want to live in that house. I don't want to work there, right? And so as we look at this, God is the one who's the builder. God is in charge. And as we see this, it says, He showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line? <laughs> Wouldn't that be our answer? <laughs> yeah, God, I see a plumb line. What's he asking him? What do you really see? What do you see spiritually? What do you understand? You don't just see the plumb line. You see what's going on. You see that these people are out of my will, right? And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore their sins the pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined and the temples of Israel will be destroyed and I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. And we don't see Amos saying, Lord, please don't do that because we're so weak, we're so small. And God doesn't relent. God has said the third time, I've relented and I've relented and I'm done relenting. This is what's going to happen. Punishment's coming. Punishment's coming. So, no charge was made. He's testing the conduct of the people against an unquestionable absolute. Plum is plum. There's nothing to... It's gravity. If you hold a string right there and you put a weight on the bottom of it, it's going to be absolutely straight. Because of what? Gravity. Now, if you swing it back and forth, what do you have? A pendulum. But what happens to the pendulum eventually? Swings to the right for a while, swings to the left for a while... When it stops swinging, where does it come back to? Straight up and down. And God says, straight up and down is the only option. We're not going to swing to the right. We're not going to swing to the left. Straight up and down is the only option. And it's an absolute option. We see the same thing if you want to read in Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 28. I'm not going to go there with you this morning. I'll let you read that on your own. But we see that no charge is made, but it was evident to Amos that they were measured and they came up wanting. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened in that passage from Daniel. Daniel's talking to the king after God wrote with his finger on the wall, and he made a couple statements, and basically the king was measured and weighed and came up short. Okay? That's what was going on there. And the current king and his dynasty were wanting, and the dynasty was going to be ended suddenly. Suddenly. I wonder how many people woke up in hell suddenly and decided, I wish I would have made that decision that I put off till the last minute when I was going to make it. I wonder how many people go to the funeral home and say, man, I didn't think they were going to die that quick. I wish I would have took more time to talk to them about Jesus. How many of us know what's going to happen once we leave this place today? Anybody? Tomorrow, the next day, five years from now, ten years from now, doesn't mean you don't plan, but we're only promised the breath we're breathing, aren't we? 
Anybody that's ever had a heart attack knows that when that heart attack hits, you're not expecting it. You're not just saying, gee, I think I'm going to have a heart attack today. I wonder what that pain is. It's probably a heart attack. Right? It happens unexpectedly. Most things that we find in our lives that are very uncomfortable happen how? Unexpectedly. And God was going to not just wipe Israel out. He was going to do it fast. And he was going to do it in, a, in an awful way that they weren't going to appreciate and they weren't going to like. Let's look at verses 10 through 17. And then we see a tattletale who is disguised as an intercessor. Here's that person that's going to cancel culture Amos as he's able to do that. And his name is Amaziah. He's the priest. Oh, why would a priest want to cancel somebody? Because he's telling the truth and he, the king doesn't want to hear the truth. The king wants to hear the lie. So watch what happens here. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. Amos is hatching a plot against you right here in your own doorstep. What he is saying is intolerable. He's saying Jeroboam will soon be killed and the people of Israel will be sent away into exile. Then Amaziah sent orders to Amos. Get out of here, you prophet. Go back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. Well, you would think Amos would say, okay, whatever, I'll go home. I'm tired. This is too hard. You're not listening anyhow. What's he say? Look at verse 14. Amos replied, I'm not a professional prophet, and I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd, and I take care of fig sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. Now then, listen to this message from the Lord. You say, don't prophesy against Israel, stop preaching against my people, but this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in this city. <laughs> wow! That doesn't sound like it's all going to be better and it's all going to be good, does it? It says, your wife is going to become a prostitute in this city, and your sons and your daughters will be killed. Your land will be divided up, and you yourself will die in a foreign land. And the people of Israel will certainly become captives in exile far from their homeland. In other words, he said, God's not fooling around and you can't change the message of God if you don't like it. And that's what we need to preach in our world today. God is not fooling around and he's not going to change the message just because people don't like it. That's what it's got to be. It's got to be that. We have to be faithful to God. In verses 10 to 11, the false priest sends news of Amos' prophecy to the king. Amos never went to the king. He's going to the people. He's going to the temple. He's going to where the priest is. He accuses Amos of a conspiracy rather than relaying a message from God himself. And what's the old saying? Don't kill the messenger. Well, Amos is just the messenger, isn't he? And here's the amazing thing. Amos is not a prophet or a son of a prophet. Amos is not a professionally trained preacher. He's just going there because he said, God called me to go there. He called me to come to you. He sent me to help you. And they rejected that, right? He correctly tells what Amos says. He says exactly what's going on. He says that God's going to wipe out Israel and he's going to kill the king. But he forgets to say that it's God's punishment for Israel's sin. That's what Amaziah does. He gives part of the story. What does the devil do? He always gives part of the story, but he never gives the reason. Just like in, in Genesis chapter 3 when he told Adam and Eve, if you eat the apple, you'll be just like God. You'll know the difference between right and wrong. What the part he left out was is that he lied to them and said they wouldn't die, and that's why we all die. You see, the consequences are far outreaching the person who's really involved. And Amaziah is just trying to look good for the king. He's trying to say, hey, man, there's a troublemaker out here, and you need to get rid of him. Uh, the false priest attempts to silence the true spokesperson of God. How many of you, I know not many people watch as much stuff as I do and what's going on in the world. How many of you have seen all the demonstrations and the, the stuff that's going on this month already? Right here in Cumberland, there's already been five events for this month, Pride Month in Cumberland. They are reaching our kids down at Canal Place. They are putting on a big party to try to get kids to come be part of the LGBTQI plus evil satanic group that's in our community. 
right down at Canal Place. They've got all these nice fancy posters up that look, and they've got bouncy blow-ups for the kids, and they've got games for the kids, and they had Drag Queen out at Lash Balls the other, yesterday, Drag Queen Bingo and something else out at Lash Balls yesterday, and there's all kinds of stuff scheduled in Cumberland for Pride Month. Any parent that takes their child to something like that does not love their child. And Satan is behind every bit of it to try to trick people to be a part of it. And do you know what? I'll guarantee you there'll be church people down there, and I guarantee you there'll be preachers down there who are supporting that. But they're not God's people. They are not God's people. They're false people teaching falsehoods. And they're leading people and walking with them straight down the path, the wide path that leads to hell. I see people with backwards collars marching with them all the time. I see people who call themselves pastors and people like that all the time marching with them and supporting them and and saying how great a thing it is. We got denominations that are splitting down the middle so one half can support it and the other half says, no, we're going to do what God says we're going to do. We got to make a difference in our world, folks. Because they're making all the difference in the world. They're making it out to be the greatest thing that ever happened. And here's the bigger plan behind it. This is Satan's plan behind it. If they can rip babies out of the womb and stop kids from being born, and then they can decide they're going to kill them all the way up till the time they're born, and then they're trying to pass laws that will let them, the mom has 28 days to decide whether the baby gets to live after it's born, and they can take our young people and get them to believe that they're in the wrong body and they can sterilize them, then what, we, what do we have then? We don't have people who are growing up. We don't have families that are together. We don't have people who are raising kids anymore. And then when they take over, it's no big deal because the family's destroyed, the culture's destroyed, the society destroyed, the morals of the country are destroyed, and Satan wins, and that's where we're headed. That's exactly where we're headed. Everybody just sees the little picture. There's a huge picture behind it. Satan is doing everything that he can to destroy this world. And if he can get people who claim to be Christians to walk along with him, my gosh, what kind of a victory is that for him? But they're going to be there. They're all going to be there. Okay, we're going to finish up here. He uses threats and bullying tactics against Amos. He says, listen, boy, you go home. I told the king on you. You get out of here. You go back down there and you prophesy down there. We don't want you here. I got more power than you. I'm the priest. This is the national temple. You do what I say. Bullying tactics are used anytime somebody speaks up for the cause of Jesus Christ or sanity. Aren't they? Anybody that speaks truth is automatically going to be bullied in some way by people who don't want to hear the truth. I was watching a video the other day. These guys go on college campuses, and this guy has a signboard on it that says, children cannot choose to use gender-affirming care or to take the drugs that cause them to change, to stop puberty. And they had a conversation with about two people. There were other people who were spitting on them. They were throwing things at them. They were coming up and stealing their microphones out of their hands, knocking their phones out of their hands, everything else, because they don't want anybody to hear the truth. They don't want anybody to hear anything except what their narrative is. But you know what? Here's the only narrative I know. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is Jesus Christ, eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all that matters. God is God. He isn't made up. God is real. God's word is real. God is who he says he is. There's coming a time that people are going to realize that hell is real and hell is hot and hell lands for eternity. And anybody that does not know Jesus Christ is going to spend their eternity there and I'm not going to stop talking about it and they can't shut me up. And they can't eat me. I'm too tough and grisly. They can't eat me. And that's where Amos stood. Amos stood in the gap. He was trying to get people to know that what you're doing is not right with God. you got to do something else. you got to do what God wants. And he went so far as to turn to God and say, God, give him another chance. God, give him another chance. And then when God said, I'm done, Amos just kind of stepped back and said, I've warned you, God's warned you, that's the way it's going to be. And our world's going to find that out one of these days. Because he's unfazed. And he he gives a special prophecy to the false priest. And we read that. Um, And then he says in verses 14 through 15, he didn't volunteer to come to Israel, 
but he was being faithful to God. Look at what he says. I'm, I'm a shepherd, and I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock. God called me away from my livelihood. God called me away from what I do to do something I've never done before, and that's speak out for him. And do you know what? If you ask God what he wants you to do, and he calls you to do something that you've never done, and he calls you to speak out for him, what ought you to do? Exactly what Amos did. Be faithful. That's what God wants. He wants our faithfulness. He wants our availability, not our ability. (coughs) Excuse me. And what the priest says and what God says are very different. And God speaks destruction and humiliation against the false priest. And there's no more intercession because God confirms the utter destruction of Israel. I believe in my heart of hearts that we who follow Christ, if we truly got down on our knees and repented of our sins and prayed and humbled ourselves before God and asked him to relent, that he would relent that he would bring something to this country that would turn this all around. Now, I don't know about any of you who are watching what's going on, but wokeism is getting a butt kicking right now. People have said, we've had enough. We're not putting up with it anymore. We're not going to allow it. But they just keep pushing, 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 pushing. Target's lost $14 billion in the last couple weeks because of their push of the whole alphabet soup thing on little bitty kids. And I'm not a Bud Light drinker, but man, I'm telling you, they're going bankrupt because they chose to do what they did. And they didn't make a bunch of Christian people mad. They made a bunch of Joe Redneck and Bubba and all the college boys who like that stuff mad. So I believe that we have to ally ourselves sometimes with people who may not exactly believe what we believe to overcome what evil's doing. And in the process, we can help those people who don't believe in Jesus come to the place where they can find Jesus. There are a lot of people that we've allied with on this. We're not allies. We're co-belligerents because there are groups that are part of this whole thing that I don't believe the way they believe, and they don't believe what the Bible says, but they're still going to be fighting against stealing babies' lives, and I'm going to be a co-belligerent with them. I can't be their ally, and I can't say I support everything they do, but I can support a cause of saving a baby's life. How about you? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to move beyond that stuff, but we can never, never, ever Turn to the right, turn to the left. We have to walk that chalk line that God makes with his plumb line so that we can be in the middle of his will. And this is the thing that I know. As we share truth with people who don't know the truth, the truth can set them free just the same way it sets us free. Can it? It absolutely can. And we have to be diligent. We can't be lazy. We can't just sit back and watch our nation fall apart because Satan is winning can't and everybody says well it doesn't affect me because i don't know anybody that's doing that stuff it absolutely affects you it absolutely affects you in every way that you can think of financially and economically and everything else it's all effective it all works and it hurts us and it damages us but you know what we who have christ have hope that even though we walk through some pretty awful things We're going to get to the other side. But who's walking along grabbing the people that are falling off the edge of the cliff? Who's walking along grabbing the people who are stuck in the mud, clear up to here, who are stuck in sin? Who's pulling them out? Who's helping them understand? It's got to be somebody that they know and somebody that they trust and somebody who loves them enough to confront them with the truth and say, if you die today without Jesus Christ, you're going to spend eternity in hell separated from him. Do you believe that? And they're going to say, no. And then you just flip your Bible open and you show them. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique, perfect son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you hear that? Better, better, Better news, isn't it? Better news. So, God doesn't always do exactly what we thought he was going to do. And we can't change God's mind, but sometimes we can intercede for somebody and get God's grace for a little bit in that person's life until they decide to make the decision that they're going to follow him. But the bottom line is, everybody who refuses God is going to face his judgment. Everybody. Everybody who refuses God is going to face his judgment. 
no matter how 